Hi everyone. In the previous lectures on the course on RF system design, we spoke about how to characterize a signal and we also discussed how to understand the frequency content is present in the signal. So using energy and power spectral density, we saw uh, we first discussed about energy and power of a signal and then we also discussed how this energy and power is distributed as a function of frequency in the frequency domain. Now with that understanding, we should be able to appreciate uh, or, or appreciate and understand and design an RF system. Now before we go into this discussion on RF system design, I will start with a brief uh, introduction. We will in fact do a mathematical treatment of the first generation analog communication systems. The, when I refer to the first generation, I am talking about the first early 1900 radio communication systems. So typically, uh, when you talk about a communication system, you have a source, a message signal which is generated at a source. And the job of any communication system is to faithfully transmit or reproduce this message signal at a destination. Very accurately. You have to reproduce it very accurately at a destination. Everything in between can be considered as a part of a communication system. Specifically, we will be topic, talking about a wireless communication system. A wireless communication system has a message signal and some mathematical operations on it and we will see what are those operations in a few moments and then a radiating element an antenna would radiate this signal r of t which will be closely dependent on the message signal m of t and then at the receiving antenna will receive an attenuated version of this signal and the receiving circuitry should extract the message signal from this received signal okay so that's the goal in everything between this between uh, after the message signal gen I mean from the source end to the destination end can be broadly classified as an RF system. But in this course we will mainly focus on the circuits before the antenna and after the message signal uh, being generated. I mean this message signal can also be a digital signal. So everything after that to the circuitry before the antenna. So we will not speak much about the antenna design but the circuits before the antenna and after the message signal in a transmitter and similarly in the receiver before the decoded message signal and after the antenna. So all the circuits will be referred to as an RF system or RF circuits. Now very briefly I will discuss these are some uh, legacy wireless communication systems. So very briefly I will discuss by the end of uh, 1800s Hertz, Heinrich Hertz had conclusively proven that electromagnetic waves exist and we had a good understanding about radiating elements that oscillating charges radiate, accelerating charges radiate and the theory was well developed. By then they knew that if you want to radiate a signal of a certain frequency F0 then the radiating element, the antenna size should be comparable to wavelength of the radiating signal. So where the wavelength is given by the speed of light because assuming it's traveling in vacuum in free space it will be C upon F0. So this is your expression for the wavelength and this wavelength should be comparable or the dimensions of this antenna radiating element should be comparable to the wavelength of this transmitted signal. Now the first generation, the legacy first generation communication systems are mainly AM um, uh, analog radios and those radios mainly the signal of transmission of interest was audio, sig audio signals or speed signals, voice signals. And those voice signals, the frequency content ranged from few hertz to few, I mean 20 kilohertz to few tens of kilohertz or rather few kilohertz. So if I want to radiate that signal directly using an antenna, we'll see roughly what are the dimensions of the antenna needed. So the wavelength of, for example, a 1 kilohertz signal, if I assume, uh, if I want to transmit a 1 kilohertz signal using a radiating element, using an antenna, the wavelength of a 1 kilohertz signal will be given by 3 into 10 power 8, the speed of light by 1 kilohertz, which is 3 into 10 power 5, and that happens to be 300 kilometers. And this radiating antenna's dimension should be of this order. And this problem exists only in a wireless system. In a wired system, typically you would have a wire kind of connecting um, the transmitter and receiver. So there is no antenna present. So we don't have this problem of you know unreasonably large size of an antenna 
but in a wireless communication system because you have a radiating antenna an antenna which has to radiate power into free space the dimensions of that antenna should be comparable to the radiating signal's power a radiating signal's wavelength and here it happens to be for a 1 kilohertz signal we have just seen that it's 300 kilometers which is an unreasonably large size an impractically large size so then how do we solve this problem what we can do based on the simple mathematics we have done in the previous lecture is that a message signal let's assume has the power spectral density of a message signal looks like this let's assume it's a power signal whose energy is concentrated very closely around uh, the dc frequency uh, f is f equal to 0 and b here is the bandwidth of the signal which is the maximum frequency content present in the power spectral density now this is your message signal what i'm going to do is that because our goal is to reduce the wavelength of transmission so which means to increase the frequency of transmission and that can be accomplished by just frequency translating the whole signal i will not do any change to the message signal i will not change the shape of the Fourier transform but just shift all the frequencies by a constant offset fc fc is a very large number okay it can be in the order of few gigahertz to hundreds of megahertz which makes the size of the antenna uh, reasonable okay it should not be unreasonably large in the order of few hundreds of kilometers reduce it to a few meters or lesser so this operation uh, is, is an operation that needs to be carried out at the transmitter part because we said the radiating antenna size will become unreasonably large we need to do this operation of translating the frequencies at lower uh, signal of lower frequency to a higher frequency by retaining its uh, shape the same so this operation is called modulation now eventually what we need to send to the destination is the method signal itself so therefore we should do the inverse operation you should be able to translate this signal back to dc back to lower frequencies so that's called demodulation so when we talk about rf system the modulation part and the demodulation part the circuits of these systems is what we are referring to so in this course we will not talk about the design of an antenna we will very briefly discuss some properties of an antenna uh, when we discuss about the link budget and how does one decide to transmit and receive uh, transmit powers for a for any rf system so we'll very briefly talk about antennas but we will not talk about the design of antennas in this course now the idea of this frequency translation now it looks very obvious to us once we have the knowledge of Fourier transforms and all of that but it was an accidental discovery so we had a music players a piano and orchestra players were playing music very close to an ac generator so this was the old generator old uh, ac generators which used to have much higher frequency than the 50 hertz and engineers working far away uh, geographically separated by a very large distance and they were suddenly starting to hear music all on they were saying standing closer to this long transmission cables and suddenly this they, they started to hear this music low frequency music so mathematically they didn't conceive the idea it was an accidental discovery that you can impress a message signal onto a high frequency signal and it can be transmitted okay so that's called uh, that act is called modulation and it can be accurately demodulated okay uh, accurately received as well and that act is called demodulation and that was um, slowly we had better understanding of all these things in early 1900s so how does one do i mean what actually does one do when we talk about this frequency shift we said we need to shift the frequency but how does one accomplish it so for that we will first need a very high frequency signal a cos omega ct so here, here i've written so this is a pure sinusoid a very high frequency now if i want to uh, if i want to represent or impress a message signal onto this onto this high frequency signal there are two ways in which i can do that the first way is i can change the amplitude of this high frequency signal in proportion to the message signal now one can immediately see this amounts to if i'm going to change its amplitude it amounts to multiplying the signal with a message signal so multiplication in time domain translates to convolution in frequency domain and we already discussed it's called the modulation property itself you know in the previous lecture when we were talking about the properties of Fourier transforms we said if you multiply it it amounts to convolution so that amounts to convolution with an impulse so this is the 
Fourier transform of the message signal and you have an impulse for a pure sinusoid, it's the Fourier transform is just an impulse. So when you convolve these two signals, we get a spectrum that looks like this. So it, it's a narrow band spectrum. Most of its energy co is concentrated at very high frequencies around uh, a frequency Fc. Now this signal, A cos omega, the high frequency signal is serving as some kind of a carrier for this message. It's carrying the message from the source to destination. So that's the whole purpose of uh, impressing this message onto this signal. Okay, so therefore this is called as a carrier signal and this frequency Fc is often referred to as the carrier frequency. And M of T will be your, our message signal. There is other way of doing uh, this frequency translation and that is what we call frequency or phase modulation. I can either change the amplitude or I can change the phase or frequency of this carrier signal. Now, For example, let's assume we have an ideal carrier signal with fixed amplitude. Amplitude is fixed. So which means in Fourier domain, all its energy, all its power is going to be concentrated at one, concentrated at one single frequency Fc. The Fourier transform will be an impulse. But now, if I change its frequency in very small amounts around this carrier frequency, now that becomes this, the signal frequency is no longer a single frequency Fc. Its energy or power will now be smeared around Fc. It will be now smeared around Fc. So in fact, we will show in probably in the next lecture, the power of a, a, a sinusoid, even if its frequency or phase is changing, the total power is always fixed. It will be equal to A squared by 2. Uh, a sinusoidal signal like this, a high frequency signal. But since its total power is fixed, its distribution is going to change. And that can be controlled by the modulation, I mean by changing the frequency slightly around the carrier frequency. So the spectrum is going to smear around the carrier frequency after we do this, what we called frequency or phase modulation. So there are two ways. One is amplitude modulation, you change its amplitude of a high frequency signal or you change the phase of frequency, you ac accomplish the same task of frequency translating the energy at lower frequencies to high frequency. So now we will first talk about amplitude and free, uh, amplitude modulation in great detail and then we will come back to frequency modulation and we will look at the spectral characteristics of both these modulation schemes in good detail. First, I'll talk about amplitude modulation. So we said uh, we are going to change the amplitude of the carrier. So if you have a pure carrier of frequency F cos FCT, so 2 pi FCT, it's a pure sine wave with an amplitude A. Every cycle, the amplitude, the peak amplitude will remain constant. So I can say this amplitude is also referred to as an envelope and the envelope is going to remain constant. In case of an amplitude modulation, we'll have the amplitude change in proportion to the message signal. So here I have written A plus M of T. A plus M of T is the amplitude of the signal. So what I'll do here for mathematical representation purposes, I'll take A constant common out. So you will get 1 plus M of T by A. Now what we will do here is that we will represent, we will uh, multiply and divide by max of mod of M of T. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to multiply m of t with max, the maximum value that the signal m of t can take. So I'll get a max of mod of m of t divided by a. So this term max of mod of m of t by a is what we are going to call the modulation index. It tells you the maximum change in the message signals amplitude in comparison to the carrier's amplitude. Okay, it's a ratio. And this can be greater than 1 as well. There is no such restriction. Here we are talking about a general definition. Very soon, once I start discussing legacy systems, the first generation radios, we will see that this mu is supposed to be less than 1. But as such, in the general definition, there is no such constraint. Mu can take any value. Uh, great. I mean, it can be greater than 1 or it will be from 0 to infinity. It can be any number between that. And this signal, m of t by max of m of t, is a normalized message signal. So now this normalized message signal, the peak value will be 1. And let's assume that this message signal uh, has equal excursions around 0 in positive or negative directions. 
So maximum minimum value will be plus 1 and minus 1. So that's what I've written here. The amplitude of the carrier signal is now changing with time. And that's given by A into 1 plus mu into m hat of t. Where mu is called the modulation index. And m hat of t here is a normalized message signal. The message signal m of t divided by the maximum value of the message signal. Now the transmitted signal of interest, the signal that I'm going to transmit is can be written this way. So your time varying amplitude times the carrier signal. So here I've shown in the dotted lines here is the message signal, which is uh, the, the carrier amplitude, which is A into 1 plus mu into m of t. So in dotted lines, I've shown it here. And the carrier's amplitude, you can see the peak values are changing every cycle. Okay, so this is called, this is how an amplitude modulated. If there was no variation in the amplitude signal, so which means if let's assume m hat, m hat of t is 0, if m of t is 0, so which means m hat of t is also 0, then the amplitude will remain constant and the carrier signal will look like this. So the amplitude will remain constant or I can see the envelope remains constant. But the moment you impress a carrier signal, a message signal onto the amplitude, your amplitude will start changing. So this is called an amplitude modulation or an AM signal. This way of, you know, transmitting this amplitude modulation signal, it's, it's also called the conventional amplitude modulation. For reasons it will become very clear in the next lecture, um, why did we choose to represent the amplitude in this way? Is there some, are there some benefits with this? It will become much clearer when we discuss about the receiver architectures. How does one receive the signal? I'll talk about it in the next lecture. At that time, it will become very clear. Right now, you can treat it as a standard definition of a conventional amplitude modulated signal. The other assumption I'll make here is that I'll assume that m of t has zero average value. Okay, so integral of m of t over time is going to be zero. So the maximum and minimum values of m hat of t is going to be plus 1 and minus 1. Okay, so if it has zero average values, the peak excursions generally uh, is symmetric around zero. So I'm going to assume maximum value is plus 1 and minimum value is minus 1. So what I'm trying to at attain here is that to see what is the peak amplitude possible and what is the minimum amplitude. And then we will also see what is the total peak peak to peak change in the carrier amplitude. So the maximum amplitude will be when your message signal goes to a maximum value, which is m hat of t is 1. So it's given by a into 1 plus mu. And the minimum value in the amplitude is given by a into 1 minus mu. So uh, when the message signal goes through a minimum value, so you'll get minimum amplitude. The difference between the two, the excursion, the total peak to peak change in the amplitude is 2 times mu times a. Okay, so these are some general definition. So the general nomenclature, so I've used it from the literature. Uh, so it will all make intuitive sense once you develop a certain understanding. But right now, we'll, we'll do a very systematic analysis. So I've just stepped, I, I just stuck with the, uh, the standard notations. Now the next step, we saw what is the time domain, how the waveform looks like. And uh, we also saw what is the peak variations, peak to peak variations. The next, we will look at what is the total power contained in the transmitted signal. If you expand the transmitted signal, if there are two terms here. The first term will be uh, a cos omega ct. The second term is mu a into m of t into cos omega ct. Now immediately when you look at this equation, if you look at the second part, that is already accomplishing the modulation operation. So it's already doing the frequency shifting operation. Then why, does, why do we need this signal? Why do we need to transmit this signal? So as I said, this reason will become obvious in the next lecture. So uh, just to give you a quick uh, heads up. So the first generation uh, radio systems, mainly the wireless communication systems were mainly radio communication systems. So your receiver had to be very simple because the radio was serving as only as a receiver. And those radios were had to be, uh, I mean, they had to be made simpler because it had to become a household product. So that was the uh, dream of the first radio builders, uh, radio engineers. Since it, for it to had to become a household product, it had to be less expensive, which means it has to be less complex. 
So the receiver had to be extremely simple. In fact, we will see in the next lecture, the receiver is what we call as a diode detector. So it will be a very simple circuitry which just has a diode and a capacitor and a resistor. For that receiver to work accurately, you need to do this. You need to send this carrier signal in addition to the modulated signal. So this signal, the carrier signal which is sent in addition to the modulated signal is referred to as the pilot signal. So this is the pilot carrier or the pilot signal. So now in the presence of this, we will see what is the total power of this transmitted signal for a conventional AM signal. So we will use the standard definition of power. So which is, uh, we will find the time average of the signal and normalize it to, uh, I mean, time average over a long time interval. Okay. And uh, that will converge to the power. So for a power signal, it should be a finite value. Now I will not go through the integral. So all you need to know is the envelope power. So if you are actually squaring this amplitude here, multiplying with cos square omega ct. So you will get cos square omega ct can be expanded as 1 plus cos 2 omega ct by half. Okay. So and uh, there will be another term which comprises of cos 2 omega ct multiplied by this term which is a square into 1 plus uh, you know mu into m hat of t the whole square and uh, one can easily show that's an odd signal and when you integrate it over a long time um, you will get an average of uh, uh, okay it's, it's not an odd signal but it's a sinusoid and when you multiply it under certain conditions you will get an average of zero so we'll be only left with the first term which is a square by 2 into 1 plus mu m hat of t the whole square dt Again, we will make another assumption which is integral of m hat of t dt is 0. By doing that, the power of the signal reduces to a square by 2 plus a square by 2 into mu square into pm, where pm is the message signal power given by this expression. Okay, So, I have just applied the standard definition of power, it is just the message signal power. So, now if you see the total transmit power is a square by 2, this is your carrier power plus the message power so which is mu a the whole square by 2 into pm this is the desired power which you need to ideally transmit but this power we said we are transmitting it in addition so that the receiver becomes much simpler in implementation okay so therefore this is not a very efficient transmitter you are wasting some additional power of transmission so that you will get some benefits and you, you can make the receiver circuitry simpler but the transmitter itself is not very efficient. This was before uh, the age of transistors. So 1940s, late 1940s is when uh, the first um, point contact transistor was invented. And 1950s, early 1950s, a practical bipolar junction transistor was built. So before that, they used to have uh, the receivers. If they had to be built, they had to be built using vacuum tube amplifiers. And they were quite bulky. So we needed to, that circuitry, the receive circuitry had to be extremely simple. Today, if you compare it with the maturity in IC technology, the receive circuitry is extremely complex. We have the, of course, the explosive growth of DSP and great improvements in radio frequency circuits. So we could, uh, we could pack so much of functionality in the receiver. So it, that's not a big problem now. But in the beginning, the first generation uh, radio communication systems, the receiver circuitry was just had to be kept as simple as possible. Because even adding a few transistors is going to make the radio set larger and larger. So they had to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, So that's why the diode director had to be implemented and they were okay with increasing the transmit power of your radio stations. In fact, the first generation radio stations used to transmit power in the order of several thousands of watts. Now typically, uh, for example, a, a cellular tower radiates power in the order of few watts. So that's the uh, typical radiation power of uh, uh, cellular towers. So I'm just giving them uh, for, 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 uh, for comparative purposes. So let, let me come back to this discussion. So here, since we said that this way of transmitting is not very efficient, we calculate a transmitter efficiency for, for this uh, conventional amplitude modulated signal. So that's the total uh, signal power which we are transmitting divided by the total signal power plus the carrier power. So here mu a whole square pm, this is the signal power of interest. So this is the useful power where the message signals uh, information is present. In a square by 2, there is no message signal at all. It's just pure carrier we are transmitting it. But we said we are doing it to make the receiver simpler. So that 
divided by the total transmitted power. So um, efficiency is a very uh, subjective term. So for example, in today's RF systems, when we talk about efficiency, we talk about the total uh, RF power delivered to the antenna to the total power dissipated in the power amplifier and some circuits before that. That also talks about the efficiency of a power amplifier uh, or the transmitter circuitry. So this efficiency is not that, it's the radiator's efficiency itself, I mean the, the sorry, the conventional AM signals efficiency itself, okay. Because we chose a certain signal type, we are getting this efficiency. The RF power which we are transmitting, out of that RF power, a fraction of it, a good part of it is not useful or does not contain any information. So that's a wasted power. So because of that, we are computing this uh, efficiency of the transmitted power. How much of it is useful is what we are trying to estimate. So that uh, if you, I mean, take the amplitude term common out, you will get mu square pm by 1 plus mu square pm. pm here is the message signals power. Now, here if you look at this term, if you want the efficiency to be 100%, if you want the efficiency to be 100%, then of course mu square times pm should be much greater than 1. If you ensure this condition, your transmit power uh, efficiency is going to be close to 100. So all we are doing is that we are just increasing this term so much that it will dwarf a square by 2. So then um, that's like since this power itself, the method signal power is so high, so even though we are transmitting the carrier power, it's not going to be high enough to impact its efficiency. Okay, but uh, for reasons which will become clear in the next lecture, your modulation index for this diode receiver to work, the diode uh, detector to work, should be less than 1. Since your modulation index should be less than 1, this term mu square pm, the maximum value will be pm itself. So that will be pm by 1 plus pm. So that is the maximum efficiency you can get out of this. Now. PM for a uh, for any practical signal, let's consider the narrow band signal. So the typical narrow band signal, I've assumed a, a, a sinusoid which is cos omega mt. It's a very narrow band signal. M hat of t is a normalized message signal. So it will be a m cos omega mt, which is your message signal, divided by max, the highest value, which is a m. So you get cos omega mt. Now the power of this normalized message signal. So I, I think I probably mentioned it before, but PM here refers to the power of the normalized message signal, not the message signal, but the normalized message signal. For a sinusoid, that will be half. So if I assume PM to be half, a narrow band signal, that's the maximum power that you can uh, trans uh, that you can assume for a message signal. So PM will be half. So if you use half, the here if I take mu as one, you will get one third or thirty three point three three percent. So this is the maximum efficiency of a conventional AM signal. Even if you assume your uh, transmitter circuitry, uh, so generally when you design a power amplifier, the transmitter, uh, uh, the power amplifier will also dissipate its own static power. I mean, it will have its own operational power. So that's a wasted power. So even if I assume all of that is power amplifiers and all the circuitry are 100% efficient, all the power they are delivering is entirely message power. There is no wasted power. Even if I assume that, you cannot exceed an efficiency of 33.33% in a conventional AM system. Because fundamentally the signal itself, the, the modulation scheme itself, entails you this loss. Because we are transmitting a carrier power additionally. Very briefly, I'll just express the spectral content of an AM signal. So uh, for the discussion here, I've assumed the message signal to have zero average value. So the spectrum will look something like this. So which means zero average value means there is no energy power at DC. So I've assumed it to be zero and it's a real signal. So what I've shown here is a magnitude spectrum. So it's symmetric around uh, the origin. For a real signal, the magnitude sp spectrum of a, uh, of, of a real signal will exhibit uh, symmetry around uh, F equal to zero. Now once we do, modulation the transmitted signal is going to look something like this a it will have two terms a cos omega ct plus mu a into m hat of t into cos omega ct a cos omega ct is a sinusoid so that will contain two impulses here 
and the second term that's your message signal up converted message signal so all you have to do is just translate it to fc and minus fc so this here the sum of these two signals the sum of these two signals is your transmit signal spectrum now i said something very interesting in the previous lecture that is that is if you have two signals you are adding two signals and if those two signals are orthogonal then you can add their individual powers and we said the test for orthogonality i mean if you know if you know the functions in time domain you can just look at them in time domain and see if are they overlapping in time if they overlap in time or if they don't overlap in time immediately you can say they both are orthogonal or you should look at their frequency domain spectrum uh, the fourier transform and from that also you can see if there are no overlaps in the spectrum i can immediately say that they both are orthogonal if i assume the method signal has zero energy at dc zero power at dc then it will have zero power at omega c as well because it's just frequency translated to fc okay so therefore if you see the carrier signal has power only at fc and nowhere else so i can say these two signals are orthogonal by that definition i can say they both don't have any overlapping frequencies so they both are orthogonal therefore to find the total power i simply have to add the individual powers so the power of the signal a cos omega ct is a square by 2 and the power of this signal here mu a m of t into cos omega ct so again this can be treated like an amplitude so i'll write it as mu a whole square by 2 into the power of message signal which i'll call it pm so this is the total message signal power so which is what we derived a little bit rigorously in a few moments ago but you can intuitively write that result as well so a square by 2 represents uh, the carrier power and mu a the whole square by 2 times pm represents the message signal power now we discussed previously uh, when we talked about Fourier transform we said half power for a real signal half of the power will be on the positive frequencies half of it will be in the negative frequencies so out of a square by 2 a square by 4 is at omega c and a square by 4 is at minus omega c similarly so i can argue out of mu mu square a square by 2 pm mu square a square by 4 pm will be in the positive frequencies and mu square a square by 4 into pm will be in the negative frequencies now again if you look at this spectrum observe the spectrum closely so the spectrum is also for a real signal the magnitude spectrum is symmetric around origin since the same string just gets translated to the carrier frequency the spectrum is going to be symmetric around the carrier frequency as well and i can say this frequency the energy or, or the frequency content present above omega c is what we call upper side band the band of frequencies above the carrier frequency and the band of frequencies below the carrier frequency is what we refer to as the lower side band now the upper side band power is going to be one half of the positive frequency power the positive frequency power is mu square a square by 2 into pm uh, by uh, 4 into pm out of which half of it will be in the upper side band so p upper side band will be one fourth uh, one half of this so that will be mu square a square by 8 okay so that will be the upper side band power and similarly the same will be your lower side band power as well okay so that's it so this is about the frequency distribution or, or the sorry the power spectrum of an amplitude mod conventional amplitude modulated signal in fact in the next lecture we will talk about a special case called sinusoidal modulation we will assume the message signal to be a sinusoidal signal and see how the spectra looks like and we will also talk about the receiver for uh, this conventional amplitude modulated signal and other uh, forms of amplitude modulation Thank you.